Reach out with your feelings. Let go. Hello and welcome to Star Wars Counseling on the Force Center podcast feed, the show that believes absolutely every part of Star Wars is great. From a certain point of view, I am your host. My name is Joseph Scrimshaw. With me, as always, is my special guest, my co-host, really, a small sip of whiskey. Here is what my co-host sounds like. Ah, tasty and insightful. Thanks, co-host. Now, if you are new to the podcast, here is the deal. I ask Star Wars fans to send in grievances, things that bother them about Star Wars, from big thematic things like what is the balance of the Force, to little things like why didn't Wedge Antilles get a medal at the Battle of Yavin, and I try to make people feel better about those things. Now, it has been a few months since I've done an episode. Uh, Things have been very busy in Star Wars land. Also in my real life land, uh, but I'm going to try to do a few more episodes here and there to discuss Rise of Skywalker, the Skywalker Saga, Star Wars in general. This particular episode is about one of the biggest and most common grievances from Rise of Skywalker, but we'll also touch on a few other mini grievances within the film. Many people sent in similar grievances, but I thought this one summed up the concerns well. It comes from Sarah Haas. Or Sarah Haas, I apologize. I don't know if it is a Haas or a Haas, so I will say both and hope that one is from the certain point of view that is correct. Sarah says, Grievance, Ray Palpatine. To me, there was nothing stronger in the sequel trilogy than the admission that Ray's parents were nobodies, that her light and her darkness came only from herself, from the Force, her own agency as a woman who is complex, that she, a nobody, was the heir to the light and the balance. I can't help but feel that the reveal of Ray Palpatine completely undermines this. I feel so hopeless, like Ray's agency has been ripped from her, to instead attribute her darkness to a man who is literally Satan. What message is this supposed to send? It feels all so empty. I want to thank Sarah and all of the other people who reached out for sharing that grievance and for sharing it in uh, such a well-articulated and thoughtful way. It is a big thing in Star Wars, so I'm happy to discuss it. I want to start the discussion, though, the way I think most thoughtful discussions should start, and that's with a few disclaimers. So the goal of this podcast is to share a few different perspectives, as well as my own personal take, and try to make people feel better if they want to. Every fan of Star Wars, of course, has the right to their opinion, and I am never trying to take that away or say your reaction is wrong. If you want to like something more or see it from another point of view, I want to try to help. That's it. But for this particular issue, I also want to acknowledge that I am a man person. He, him pronouns and all of the societal benefits, privilege, and sometimes in my own experience, personal emotional baggage that comes with being a man person. But I do recognize that Rey is a woman character and that a lot of the concerns about her story come from women who have made a strong bond with the character. And I totally recognize that women might have a different understanding of the character and her arc because of their own personal lived experiences than I might. I also recognize different women have different strong feelings because no group of people is a monolith thinking and moving in lockstep. I do my best to listen, read up, and understand different perspectives on Ray, but uh, I acknowledge that maybe there's a nuance that I am missing. That said, I really, really love the character of Rey, the performance by Daisy Ridley, and find myself having the same emotional reaction to the character that I did when I was a kid to Luke Skywalker, and then again as a young adult to Obi-Wan Kenobi in the prequels. I find Luke, Obi-Wan, and Rey inspiring. They all make me want to dance around my living room with a toy lightsaber and try to live up to their example of strength and heroism. So everything that I'm saying on this podcast comes from a place of really respecting and treasuring the character of Rey. And since the discussion around Rise of Skywalker has been heated and complex, I also want to be clear that I also really love The Last Jedi. I have some criticisms, both uh, personal as a Star Wars fan and more analytical as a writer-critic person, but that is true of 
every Star Wars movie, but for the most part, I've spent the last two years talking up The Last Jedi on this podcast. I've done multiple episodes trying to make different people feel better about the parts of The Last Jedi they did not like, so this is not coming from someone who dislikes The Last Jedi at all. And I definitely have some criticisms of The Rise of Skywalker, but for Rey, I think her story tracks well between the two movies and between all three films in the sequel trilogy. So, my final disclaimer. In the years before The Rise of Skywalker came out, I also really liked the idea of Rey from Nowhere. I think I was ready to accept that there might be a big twist or new information in Rise of Skywalker because a lot of the behind-the-scenes talk about the movie. Abrams was quoted multiple times saying there's more to her backstory. Fans spotted the same ship that left Rey on Jakku in the trailer for The Rise of Skywalker. So I was really braced for Rey being more firmly connected to an existing lineage. I thought they might go with a clone or a new chosen one born of the Force like Anakin. I wasn't sure how I felt about it, but I braced for it. In our last main show of Force Center, the episode that we did leading up to the release of Rise of Skywalker, I said what was most important to me was not where Rey was from or who she was connected to, but that she got to choose her own destiny. And for me, I think that's what happened and what makes Rey as a Palpatine, and more importantly, Rey as a Skywalker, work for me. So to think through it, I'd like to discuss Rey's lineage from a couple different points of view. First, we're going to walk through her arc and try to decipher what I think the film is trying to say. Then, we're going to look at one of the key reasons people liked Rey from nowhere, and that is the idea of democratization of the Force and power in general, and what exactly that means for Star Wars and for our real world. Finally, I want to look at the movie from a structural writing point of view and see how that supports the idea of Rey being a Palpatine and then a Skywalker. So let's dive into her actual arc and the decisions in the movie. The first bit of counseling I'd offer is that I think The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi, and The Rise of Skywalker offer an escalation of the fears that Rey faces. In The Force Awakens, Rey fears a lack of belonging. She holds on to the hope that her parents will return. She fears the sudden awakening of this power inside her. Over the course of the film, she finds the possibility of a family in Han, which is sadly taken away immediately. She also finds Finn and Leia and even the idea of Luke. She sees a dark mirror of what she could be in Kylo Ren. As The Force Awakens ends and The Last Jedi begins, Rey's greatest fear is that she doesn't have a place in the story. She is trying to accept that, as Maz Kanata told her, the belonging she seeks is not behind her, but ahead. But she fears this might not be true. This is made clear by her trying to hand the lightsaber, the one that called to her, over to Luke, which she literally does twice in The Last Jedi. She's not ready to accept the lightsaber herself. She keeps trying to give it back to Luke. Rey seeks guidance and understanding about her own power and her place in the story from Luke, but doesn't initially get it. Luke is not providing the belonging she seeks, so she answers the call of the Dark Side Mirror Cave and looks for answers about the belonging from the past. Specifically, she asks to see her parents. Instead, the Dark Side Cave shows her nothing but repeating images of herself. I think the cave is showing her both her greatest fear and the ultimate truth. Her fear is of being alone, not having family, not being a part of the story, but the image of just Rey can also be seen as validating and empowering. She doesn't need anyone else to define her story. All Rey needs to define herself is Rey, and I think this ultimately proves true. But even after the cave, Rey is still trying to give the lightsaber away. After offering it to Luke a second time, she leaves to find Kylo, hoping to turn him back to the light, back to Ben Solo, metaphorically trying to hand the lightsaber, the legacy, the part in the story, to him. Rey basically says to Luke right before she leaves Octo that if Luke won't be the hope that the galaxy and the Resistance needs, maybe Ben Solo will if he accepts his destiny. Because when Kylo and Rey touch fingers in their awesome and intimate Force Skype, I believe they both see a part of the story. They see it from their point of view and infer the answers they want. I think they both believe what they saw was true. 
Ray sees Kylo turning on Snoke and assumes that means he'll turn to the light. I believe Kylo sees a part of the truth that Ray's parents sold her off and died on Jakku. I believe Kylo also wants this to be true because he knows it's the version of truth that Ray fears. He knows she will be horrified at the idea of having no parents, no acceptance from Luke at this point, no belonging, and therefore no place in the story. Kylo hopes the confirmation of her fears will break Ray, and she will give in to the resulting anger and pain and join him, join the dark side. Because if Ray gives in, it will validate Kylo's choices and actions. More on that in a bit. When Rey and Kylo have their moments of truth after killing Snoke and defeating the Praetorian Guards, Kylo shares his part of the truth, but as people have pointed out, Rey is the one who actually says the line about her parentage. They were nobody. This tracks well for me because that's the way she saw them. That's the way they presented themselves when she was a child. As we learn in Rise of Skywalker, Rey has more repressed memories of her parents than she's fully aware of at this point. And as Kylo tells us, her parents had made the choice to be no ones, to hide themselves, and more importantly, Rey from Palpatine. But even with all this pain and fear, Rey doesn't break in that moment. She wants Ben to stop the bombardment of Resistance ships carrying Finn and Leia and all of her friends, but Kylo won't. So Rey resists. She finally reaches out for the Skywalker family blade herself, and by the end of The Last Jedi, she's become aware that she did make a difference to Luke, that she can't turn Kylo, and that the future is hers. She's accepted the broken pieces of the saber, her responsibility as the new Last Jedi, in hopes that she can build something out of it all. She inherits the fractured legacy of the Jedi in the form of the lightsaber under the guidance of Leia. Now, in between the movies, Leia begins to train her. Based on the timeline that gets laid out in the new visual dictionary, Rey and Leia spend a decent amount of time on that planet that we see in the movie, Agent Kloss a beautiful, verdant, green planet teeming with life and the Force. So, let's take a second to focus on this time and this relationship. For the first time in her life, Rey has a part of what she's sought. Rey has been looking for belonging, family, and help finding her place. She only got to know Han and experience his kindness briefly, she has a friendship with Finn, a strange bond with Luke, and an even stranger bond with Ben Solo. But Leia. Leia is not just a Jedi Master, not just the leader of the Resistance. She's the mother Rey never had. Leia trusts Rey with the legacy of her family, the Jedi, the Resistance. Leia is trusting Rey with Leia's own personal legacy is the keeper of the flame of hope. There is a deep bond there. Now, sadly, we don't get to see it on screen as much as we could have because of Carrie Fisher's untimely passing, but I think it is there in the scenes that we do have, in the specific dialogue and the great acting choices from Daisy Ridley. So by the time The Rise of Skywalker begins, where is Rey at? What does she fear? I think the film shows us very quickly that now that she's accepted her power, her responsibility, her place in the story, she fears the weight of it all. She still wants and needs connection. She has Leia and Finn and Poe and Rose and Chewie and BB-8, but she wants to connect with the Jedi that have come before. Be with me. Be with me. She wants, what I think all of us want, reassurance that we're on the right path, particularly if we feel burdened by great responsibility. Poe is upset with her because she is staying on the relative safety of Agent Kloss when they could use her and her power out in the field. Rey wants to get out there and help, but she fears that power. She struggles with her own anger and trauma. Throughout the film, we're shown again and again that Rey's natural inclination is toward kindness, but her fear and anger are also a risk. She's also been studying the ways of the Jedi, using the Force for knowledge and defense, but for my own headcanon, I'm sure those ancient Jedi texts that she proactively took and has been studying are also full of caution at the risk of falling to the dark side. I think she is now really understanding 
what Luke was wrestling with in The Last Jedi. How can you make sure your actions don't cause more harm, again, particularly when you have great power? This tension between Rey's kindness and Rey's anger plays out again and again in Rise of Skywalker. We see Rey's anguish at accidentally hurting BB-8 when she gets angry and overzealous about destroying the training remote. We see that her instinct and training lead her to heal the big snake, which is called a vexus, thanks Visual Dictionary, rather than attack it. Even in the midst of her own pain, she reaches out to fix Dio's squeaky wheel. Much like she related to BB-8 lost and alone on Jakku, she relates to Dio, immediately recognizing he was mistreated and tells him, it's okay, you're with us now. She's in a place to offer others what she longed for, belonging and safety. Rey also shows 3PO more respect than anyone ever has in the entire saga when she says, you know the odds better than anyone. I feel like The Rise of Skywalker underlines Rey's natural instinct toward kindness and empathy, but like her Force powers, it's always been there. In The Force Awakens, we see her rescue BB-8 from Tito, and her selfless decision not to sell him to Unkar Plot. Her constant concern that his antenna is working every time she sees him, which is great. Even after Finn has repeatedly taken her hand and she's told him not to in The Force Awakens, when Finn has fallen, Rey literally reaches her hand out to pick him up. When Leia asks Rey to go to Luke on Octo, she accepts the responsibility and she tries to get through to Luke, tries to reassure him that he didn't fail Kylo. Even though she's been tormented by Kylo, she tries to understand him and his point of view. She tries to reach out to him and turn him back to the light. Throughout all three films, Rey is constantly reaching her hand out to help others, both literally and and metaphorically, because that's who she is. But to get back to the Rise of Skywalker specifically, we begin to see that despite this natural inclination, the thing Rey fears most is her own potential for violence. This echoes the fears of both Anakin and Luke, but with a different perspective. Anakin feared losing Padme. Luke feared losing Leia. In their moments of crisis and greatest tests, they feared not having enough power to save the people they loved. But Rey fears it is herself and her power that will hurt the people she loves. This is expressed by her regret at accidentally hurting BB-8, the terror of lightning exploding from her hands and destroying the transport, which at the time she believed caused her to kill Chewie while she was actively trying to save him. On the Death Star wreckage, when she is at her most confused and frustrated, she force pushes Finn away. We're repeatedly shown in The Rise of Skywalker that Rey has accepted she has power and a place in the story, but now she's afraid of what that power can do and who it might hurt. Which is when she is told the full truth that she is the granddaughter of Palpatine. Growing up on Jakku, Rey certainly heard tales of the Jedi. She's certainly been educated on the horrors behind galactic history being a part of the Resistance and trained in the Force by Leia. She is aware of who Palpatine is and what he means. So for someone looking to define their role, someone who has long strived for parental figures to give her guidance, the worst possible thing she could hear is that the belonging she seeks could come from an evil person who brought suffering and pain to the entire galaxy. For me, it marks an escalation of fear. In The Last Jedi, Rey fears she has no place in the story, no way to define herself. In The Rise of Skywalker, she hears she does have a place and a way to define herself, and it's the worst possible way. Now, and this is super important to me, that's what Rey fears. That's what some of the characters want Rey to believe. But in my opinion, it is not the truth. Palpatine is a face and a name and a legacy to give definition to Rey's fear. But, and again, to me this is super important, Ray's fear is still her own about herself and her power. Ray's anger and fear aren't inherited from Palpatine. They're not in her blood. They're in her life experience. She has every reason to be angry, frightened, and confused. She has had a rough life, deserted as a child, scraping to get by and even feed herself. She has to build her staff 
as a means of defense. Fighting and violence were a necessary part of her survival on Jakku. Not knowing what happened to her parents, but clinging to the hope they would return in order to keep herself going. And then when she finally does leave Jakku, she meets Han, someone who seems to intrinsically understand being an orphan. He appreciates her skills with the Falcon. Han sees her and validates her. And then he's murdered in front of her eyes by a monster who kidnapped her and invaded her mind. She met Finn, and they bonded over taking their first steps into a larger galaxy together. Rey is moved that Finn came to Starkiller Base specifically to save her. Then he was almost killed by that monster, that snake, Kylo Ren. Rey felt a bond with Luke, but he resisted helping her. And when he did see the error of his ways, when he did acknowledge that she was right and the Jedi needed to act, he immediately passed away, leaving Rey without that guidance. Even after the horror Kylo Ren has put her through, She relates to his loneliness, to his fear of abandonment, to someone else who feels power coursing through him and can't decide what to do with it. She almost got through to him, but he disappointed her too. Once her parentage and history are revealed, she finds out Palpatine had her parents killed and she wants revenge. All of these things are hers, about her life and her experience. They have nothing to do with with her actual bloodline. This is just her lived experience, even Palpatine killing her parents. I mean, yes, it it sucks that it was specifically her grandfather, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's natural to be angry at anyone who kills your parents. So Rey, despite her inherent kindness and bravery, is afraid of her anger and the power she has to express it. Now she has a name and a face that appears to confirm that fear, Palpatine. Now, and again, this is an essential part of the movie to me, Rey is given commentary and guidance on who she is by multiple people. Luke, Leia, Finn, Kylo, Palpatine himself, even the vision of her dark self tries to get inside Rey's head. But crucially, to me, so important, the only people who claim being a Palpatine defines Rey in any way are the villains. Kylo, before his transformation back to Ben, wants Rey to believe falling is inevitable due to her blood because he wants to believe that's true about himself. He says it fairly blatantly in the Death Star throne room. I'm paraphrasing, but Kylo says to Rey, darkness is in our nature, surrender to it. Just like he wanted to break her by calling her a no one, Kylo wants to break her by calling her a Palpatine. Because if Rey breaks in response to who her grandfather was, then it means Kylo is not weak for breaking in response to who his grandfather was. Rey falling to the dark side absolves Kylo. He even underlines this argument by bringing up Rey's connection to Leia. Kylo tells Rey, now that she, Rey, knows the truth about her lineage and has opened herself even a little to the dark side, Rey can never go back to Leia just like Kylo can't. Kylo is not, at this point, interested in reflecting anything truthful about Rey's situation. He is mining her experiences for similarities to his own that will validate the dark side choices he has made. Kylo also utters one of the lines about Rey's lineage that can feel most upsetting for some of us. When he's revealing Rey's lineage to her, he tells her Palpatine fears her power because it is his Palpatine's power. It's a line that can feel like it's really minimizing her agency, that says it's not her inherent power, that it's something that originates with a man, Palpatine, and is just handed down to her. But again, for my reading of the film, that's because Kylo, the villain who is trying to break Rey's resolve, frames it that way. He frames it that way specifically to try to take Rey's agency away. He wants her to feel doomed, By her connection to Palpatine, he wants her to feel defined by Palpatine's power because he is lying to himself that he is defined by Vader's power. But for me, not only is this the rhetoric of the villain, there's also a big distinction to be made. Yes, her bloodline might be the reason she has access to the Force, but it doesn't define her choice of what to do with that power, with her power. 
Anakin's connection to the Force might be the result of Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis manipulating the midi-chlorians to create life. Uh, just for the sake of argument, imagine that's true, as Sidious hints at in the Revenge of the Sith opera scene. That heritage didn't define Anakin's fall to the dark side. His own choices did. Luke and Leia were not doomed by their father's blood, even though they inherited their strength in the Force from the family line. Luke and Leia's choices made them champions of the light. The story of Ben Solo's fall to the dark side is complicated and still being told, but even if Palpatine was whispering to him throughout his entire life, playing on his fears, Ben Solo did not have to give in. Ben Solo was not alone. Ben had the guidance and love of Han, Leia, and Luke. At some point, Ben made a choice. It doesn't matter that his Force powers were inherited by the Skywalker line. He made the choice. But at this point in the movie, Kylo doesn't want to accept that. For him, it's more comforting to believe he couldn't resist his legacy as the heir of Vader. So he wants Rey to think the same. So, moving on to other characters' commentary to Rey on her lineage. When she enters the Emperor's vault, she sees a vision of herself, of Dark Rey, Queen of the Sith. Dark Rey says, never be afraid of who you are. This is, of course, a twist on something Leia had said earlier in the movie, which we'll discuss more in a moment. But this dark vision also wants Rey to define herself by her anger. This is, of course, a manipulation of the dark side. To me, it's a similar refrain, like Vader saying Anakin was weak and he killed him, or Kylo saying Ben was weak and he destroyed him. Dark Rey wants Rey to believe there's no escaping her dark side destiny. And if you choose to look at that encounter, similar to the Dark Side Mirror Cave on Octo or the Dark Cave on Dagobah, it's Rey's own fear speaking to her. At this point in the film, that's what she fears, that it's Palpatine and his legacy and her anger that define her. Just like Luke taking his weapons into the cave, that's the fear that Rey brought in to that room with her. So that is what she sees. Now... That's a lot of darkness, so let's look at the crucial things that are said to Rey about her identity by her friends and mentors. Finn is certainly trying to be there for Rey. He's empathizing with the crisis of identity that she's having. He's asking her to talk to him and responds that her talk of destroying Palpatine out of vengeance doesn't sound like the Rey he sees. That said... I think the most important person who reflects on Rey's identity is Leia. I think Leia knows the truth on multiple levels. Leia doesn't see Rey is needing to make a choice about who she is. I think Leia simply sees the truth of who Rey is and always has been and wants to support Rey in seeing that truth. I think Leia sees Rey's spirit of kindness and bravery and strength and commitment and Leia recognizes it as being very, very similar to her own spirit. Leia is the character in the entire Skywalker saga who has never broken. She's been pure of heart, fighting for what's right through torture and loss and pain. She's had tragedy, she's had moments of doubt, but she's persevered, and she sees that in Rey. Now, I very much wish that Carrie Fisher had not passed away, and all of those ideas could have been filmed fresh. But in the spirit of Leia, I like to face those scenes with honesty. It's not ideal, but let's see what we can make of them. Once you get past any feelings you might have about the actual footage, and I understand there are a lot of different ways to feel about it, I think the content of the scenes between Rey and Leia are beautiful and crucial to Rey's arc. When Rey wants to go find Exegol and try to stop Palpatine, Leia initially says no. At this point, I think Leia has discovered or sensed the truth about Rey's parentage, and Leia knows how hard it is to hear that. She went through the trauma of hearing Vader was her father. In the book Bloodline by Claudia Gray, we see Leia wrestle with when and how to tell Ben about his connection to Vader. So it makes sense to me that Leia would want to wait for the right time to tell Rey when she feels Rey is ready. So initially, Leia says, no, don't go, don't face him, not yet. But in that same scene, Rey immediately tells Leia she's going to go anyway, because that's what Leia would do. A great way to remind Leia of their shared sense of bravery, responsibility, and agency. Just in your mind, start comparing different scenes of Leia and Rey. 
Back in A New Hope, Leia grabs that blaster in the hallway of the detention center because someone needs to save their skins. The same way Rey runs into that garbage ship the Falcon on Jakku because someone needs to do something to get her and Finn and BB-8 out of this. They have a very similar spirit, and we get to see it. After this conversation, Leia gives Rey the family lightsaber. It's a vote of confidence. Leia trusts that Rey is strong enough to deal with the truth because Leia knows who Rey is, which is why her parting wisdom to Rey is simply, never be afraid of who you are. And to me, that means Leia sees who Rey is. It's Leia saying, you're a strong, kind, brave, flawed, wonderful person who's already been through hell and keeps fighting for the light. Leia isn't advocating for Rey to make a change. Leia is saying Rey is already everything that she needs to be. And Leia knows more than anyone that the terrible acts of a family member don't change that. Any more than Vader's acts defined Leia. Leia defined Leia. The kind parentage of Bale and Brea Organa guided Leia. Just like the kind mentorship of Leia and Luke can guide Rey. Beyond the force training and bloodlines and winning wars, this is just about found family. Leia has adopted Rey the way Bale and Brea adopted her, the way Owen and Brew Lars adopted Luke and gave him a safe and stable, if boring, childhood. Leia knows the trauma that Han fought through because he didn't have anyone there for him when he was growing up. She understands what Rey went through. Leia understands Rey's pain and the strength that Rey has had to overcome it. Luke reaffirms this when he says Leia trained Rey because she saw her heart, her spirit. Luke says some things are stronger than blood, reinforcing the importance of both found family and every individual choosing their own identity. From their personal experience, both Luke and Leia understand the reality of the Sith and the Jedi. Vader was not inevitable. He was a choice that Anakin made, and at the end of his life, unmade. Luke shares the lessons that he learned, partially from Rey coming to the island and trying to convince him to act to face his fear, and returns the favor by encouraging her to do the same. Now, I know I've had a lot of talk about how different people are sharing with Rey their perspective on her identity, but I think Rey makes a ton of choices of her own in this movie. Rey actively chooses to face her fear of Palpatine, her fear of her own destiny, her fear of herself and her power. She chooses to go and fight for hope. And when she gets to Exegol, this is when we get the final person to weigh in on Rey telling her who she is. The final, and the worst, old Sheev Palpatine himself. Now, Palpatine has a lot to say about who Rey is, but like always with the Sith, it's a mixture of truth, lies, and manipulation. For me, the big picture important thing is that Palpatine tries to get Rey to believe whatever is most advantageous for him in the moment, but all he really cares about is his own power. Palpatine doesn't give a damn about Rey being his granddaughter, I think. All he cares about is a young, powerful Force user to possess. Now, I want to take a quick sidebar to discuss Palpatine's plan. On one hand, I think it's pretty straightforward. On the other hand, Palpatine does do a lot of improvisation in response to changing events that get in his way, so I can see how it could start to become muddy. That said, here's my reading. Palpatine died because... He says so. Literally in the movie, he says, I've died before. Through some mixture of arcane magic and science, his cultists, the Sith Eternal, scraped up his wrecked body, revived him, and he's been hanging from a claw machine pumped with mysterious bubbling red evil fluid for years. That last sentence is going to be my pitch for the Booker comic that will eventually tell this story. Hanging from a claw machine pumped with mysterious bubbling red evil fluid for years. Sounds fun. Anyway, from this weakened position, Palpatine knows he needs to groom a powerful force user to possess their body. His granddaughter would work great, so he sends emissaries out to find her and bring her back alive. The uh, admittedly confusing Ochi Bastoon plot unfolds. Rey's parents sacrifice themselves to save her, and Rey ends up alone on Jakku, and her parents are dead buried in a pauper's grave in the deserts of Jakku. 
Meanwhile, young Ben Solo is also a great target for Palpatine to control and possess. And let me say that Palpatine would love to possess him. Because when your whole thing in life is revenge, possessing the grandson and the nephew of the Jedi who threw you down a shaft, killed you, and wiped out your empire would seem like a really great thing to do. So for years, Palpatine somehow whispers through the Force to Ben, stoking his fears that he can't live up to the legacy of the Skywalkers and the Solos and the Organas, that his parents and his uncle fear him, that they want to reject and kill him because they're hypocrites and liars. Palpatine somehow inserts Snoke into Ben's life. At the time of this recording, that story is just beginning to be told in the comic book The Rise of Kylo Ren. Now, even knowing only part of the story, so far, it makes sense, because Palpatine himself successfully turned Anakin after years of manipulation, after pretending to be a kind mentor. Palpatine needs Snoke to do the same to Ben, because trying to turn Luke real quick in Return of the Jedi did not work out well for Palpatine. See the whole dying after being thrown down a shaft thing. And Palpatine, in his current state of hanging from a claw machine, is in no shape to go manipulate Ben himself. So Snoke it is. So when Rey's Force powers are awakened in The Force Awakens, Palpatine already has Ben Solo in his grasp. Han even says in The Force Awakens to Ben, Snoke is only using you for your power, which at this point, through Palpatine, ended up being true. So at this point, from Palpatine's perspective, it's got Ben Solo, Rey is nothing but a threat. Regardless of her bloodline, it's the light side of the Force that awoke in her. It's the Skywalker's hero's blade that's calling out to her. So for me, it makes sense that Palpatine, through Snoke, would just want to get Luke's location from Rey and then eliminate the threat, which, of course, does not work out for Snoke. So by the beginning of Rise of Skywalker, I think Palpatine is sincere when he tells Kylo the girl is a threat and he wants her dead. So he tries to get Kylo to do it. Then Kylo, through the intervention of his mother Leia, Jedi Master, makes the choice to turn back to the light, and Palpatine's plan with Ben Solo is foiled. And he says almost exactly that in the movie. Palpatine says, the princess of Alderaan has disrupted my plan. So he pivots to plan B, draw Rey to him and prey on her fears until she breaks. I think it's also important to note that Palpatine doesn't just want to turn her to the dark side as he did with Anakin and Luke. He wants Rey to strike him down in anger so he can complete some unnatural, gross Sith ritual that will allow him to possess her. It is very creepy and disturbing, but I do think it's a very specific and purposeful message that an old man wants to totally control and possess a young woman, and this is the story of her saying absolutely no to that. So, back to the fight. Rey is strong and resists Palpatine's manipulations. She chooses to take inspiration from the actions of her parents. They chose not to be defined by Palpatine and his actions. They defied Palpatine by hiding and protecting Rey. Palpatine uses a familiar and successful tactic on Rey. Join me or you will lose everyone you love. It worked when Anakin needed to save Padme. It almost worked on Luke when Palpatine threatened his friends on Endor and Vader specifically threatened Leia. Luke almost turned to the dark side. So, Following his standard tactic, Palpatine shows her the small, doomed fleet of resistance fighters. Her friends, Finn and Poe and BB-8, the hope that Leia has entrusted her with, are all up there dying. Palpatine also zeroes in on Rey's fear of being alone and having no belonging. He says Luke Skywalker was saved by his father, but the only family Rey has here is him, Palpatine. Rey is tempted to give in for the most noble reason, to sacrifice herself in the hope that her friends could live. But this is when Ben Solo arrives. Rey is encouraged by not being alone. And I think this is where the twin themes of this movie really begin to converge. I think the movie champions individuals making their own choices of their own free will. But it also reminds us that we are stronger together, that there is great value in kindness, reaching out, and found family. In that crucial moment, 
Ray makes her own choice to resist, but it is bolstered by her found family of Ben Solo being there to stand with her. But still, of course, things don't go well for them. Palpatine discovers the Force dyad connection between Ray and Ben and sucks power out of them. And I do really like the symmetry here. Earlier in the movie, we've seen the selfless and kind Jedi ability to Force heal, to give of yourself to help someone else. So it makes sense to see Palpatine do the exact opposite. A dark side ability I'm thinking of is not force heal, but force steal. An ability that sucks the energy out of others to selfishly give to yourself. So Palpatine gives himself a new body and also uses some of that force energy to make himself some fancy new robes. A cool new ability that I like to think of as force tailor, I guess. Anyway, then petty as ever. Palpatine throws Ben Solo, the last Skywalker, down a shaft because he, Palpatine, was thrown down a shaft by a Skywalker, and Rey ends up defeated and alone. And I think this is such a key moment for Rey because it plays on her oldest and deepest fear that she is alone. Ben has been defeated. She's on the ground looking up at Palpatine's lightning, dropping her friend's and the entire resistance out of the sky. She could give up. She could give into her fear, but instead she follows her nature to reach out. She takes a deep breath and reaches into her connection with the Force. She looks past the chaos and the horror of the ships falling out of the sky and looks into the cosmic Force itself. And for me, this is a true and thrilling Jedi moment. She is calm and centered. She passes the Jedi trial of moving beyond her fear into hope. And the Jedi reach back to this powerful woman and offer her words of encouragement and truth. Rey has power, and she chose what to do with it. She chose the path of the Jedi. Yes, she has fear. She has anger. It's hers, born of her lived experience. But she has made the choice to reach out, to protect, and to heal. She is a true Jedi. And the Jedi's support of Rey is true growth for them as well. They have grown beyond their fears. These are not the same Jedi who looked at a small, frightened boy named Anakin Skywalker and judged him for missing his mother. These are the voices of Jedi who have also learned their lesson that attachment is not just a risk, it's a strength. Qui-Gon says, every Jedi who has ever lived, lives in you now. Yoda says, alone, never have you been. Kanan says, what is to me perhaps the most moving and powerful message, because it ties directly to what Luke and Leia see in Rey. Kanan says, in the heart of a Jedi lies her strength. And Luke, passing on what he has learned, reminds Rey, the Force will be with you, always. With their support, Rey rises and takes those steps herself. And it's at this point that one more person tries to tell Rey who she is instead of letting Rey choose for herself. Palpatine reveals his true colors. He calls her nothing but a scavenger who can't match his power. He tries to belittle her and play on her fear of being no one and not having a place in the story. But she is what she has decided to be. A Jedi. Rey summons both Luke and Leia's lightsaber, supporting the thematic idea that there is strength not only in personal choice, but in the unity of two, the symbolic strength of both Skywalker twins, the symbolic strength of attachment. And she acts in the true Jedi spirit of defense. She blocks Palpatine's hate and throws it back, allowing him to destroy himself. And in the process, in defense of others, she sacrifices her own life. And then Ben sacrifices himself so she can live. More on that in a bit as well. So, Rey started out by fearing she had no place in the story, then discovered she had the worst place in the story she could imagine being a Palpatine. The villains try to break her by saying she does not have a choice, that her ancestry determines her fate. The heroes, Luke, Leia, Finn, just reflect her own truth back at her. You are naturally kind, with a fighting spirit to defend your friends and help people. In the movie, we get to see Rey personally make that choice 
again and again. And finally, at the end of the movie, we get to see Rey make one more choice. She makes a pilgrimage to Tatooine. She can't go to Leia's childhood home on Alderaan for obvious and upsetting reasons. I interpret this scene at the end of Rise of Skywalker, not that she's moving in, but that she's reflecting on where Luke grew up. Yes, Luke was bored and restless on Tatooine, but he was loved by Owen and Beru. He was watched over by Obi-Wan Kenobi. He had something there on Tatooine that Rey did not as a child. Personally, I can feel that in the shot of her looking around the homestead, looking at that dining table where Luke used to sit with Owen and Beru. Rey is happy for finding her place in the story, but the story is hers now. So she finds a place to respectfully bury the past. Not kill it, as Kylo advocated, but put the past to rest. She buries the lightsabers of the Skywalker twins and ignites her own new lightsaber. She is continuing the tradition of the past, but making it her own. Her lightsaber is built out of what looks like, to me, her staff. It is built out of her unique past and lived experience growing up on Jakku. It is a different color than Luke's or Leia's or Ben's or Kylo's. It's yellow, traditionally the color of those who guard the legacy of the Jedi. And Rey is not alone. She's with the first friend she met on this journey, BB-8. Somewhere out there in the galaxy are her friends, Finn, Poe, Rose, Chewie, Dio. She has the Falcon right there. The spirit of all the Jedi that have ever lived will be there when she needs them. Then, when the old woman comes by and asks her who she is, Rey answers. We see Rey's final choice. She takes the name of her mentors, of two kind, brave, flawed people who were like parents to her. But for me, she really just chooses the person she's always been. Kind, resourceful, strong. She leads with her heart and her spirit. She sees that in Leia, and Leia saw that in her. Rey sees her responsibility in the challenge of being a Jedi in Luke. Luke trusted her with that responsibility. Rey doesn't just choose Skywalker at random. She chooses it because she relates to her mentors. She chooses a name that symbolizes who she's always been, and she fulfills the wisdom that Leia gave her. Never be afraid of who you are. She is Rey, Rey Skywalker, a Jedi knowledgeable about the past, but leading herself into the future. Now, I'm going to have another sip of my whiskey, take a quick break, and then a few thoughts about democratization of power in Star Wars and the structural choices of The Rise of Skywalker. Hey, Force Center friends, make sure you're keeping up to date on all the great content from Jennifer Landa. Whether it's YouTube, Instagram, or TikTok, you whippersnappers, Force Center's own Jennifer Landa continues to bring you fun, informative, and insightful laughs and moments. Also, Jennifer brings her experience and perspective as a Star Wars-loving mother to her DIY projects, blogs, and more. So be sure to head on over to JennyLanda.com. That's J-E-N-I-L-A-N-D-A.com for articles like how to make your own Darth Maul sneakers or 10 unique Star Wars baby gift ideas. Follow Jen on Twitter and Instagram at Jennifer Landa and on TikTok as Jennifer Landa 1138 <laughs> And we are back. And by we, I mean me and my found family of a small sip of whiskey. So let's talk a little bit about democratization of the Force and of Star Wars in general. One of the concerns I've heard the most about Rey being a Palpatine by blood and a Skywalker by choice is that the idea of Rey from nowhere emphasized the idea that anyone can be powerful, that you don't have to inherit your power. Now, I definitely think that Rey being a Palpatine, who chooses to carry on the legacy of the name Skywalker, cements the Skywalker saga as a story that deals heavily in family legacy. But for me, that is not the whole story. I think the rise of Skywalker, and Star Wars in general, still makes the argument that power comes from lots of places, in lots of ways, and we can all be heroes based on our choices. 
First, let's look at Force users in specific, uh, a brief overview of how I read the Force in modern Star Wars canon. It surrounds us and binds us. It's in all living things. We are all a part of the Force. It's one of the reasons the Jedi believe in being selfless. Through the Force, we are all connected. We are all one. I think that's beautiful and reflects a lot of the themes of family, friends, unity, and pacifism in Star Wars. But I also think the story of Star Wars is that only some characters have a strong enough connection with the Force to wield it. Now, I know there are some people who read it in a different way, and I totally understand. I think there are people who like to approach Star Wars from the idea that anyone could learn to use the Force. But for the sake of this discussion, let's just approach Star Wars from the idea that no amount of training could teach Han Solo to move things with his mind. Some people have a stronger connection to the Force. Others don't, even though the Force is inside all of us. Now, before the rise of Skywalker, one could interpret the story that Rey got her Force power at random. It's just the will of the Force or the chaos of the galaxy causing Rey from nowhere to be born very, very powerful in this Force. She is simply born, she has power, and the story goes on. Now, with the rise of Skywalker, we have the more definitive idea that Rey's Force power is from a lineage of family blood. For me, both are still acts of birth. They're both, in their own way, random. There's nothing about Rey's intrinsic character that got her Force powers, just like there's nothing about Luke or Leia's characters that inherently got them Force powers. They were born with them. She was born with the powers the way uh, we are all, in real life, I think, born with different skills and abilities. What defines Rey is the choice she makes with how to use that power. Whether it comes from fate or inherited by blood, it's still her power. And where it comes from doesn't affect the people around her or the galaxy at large, or even ultimately herself. Her choices in how to wield that power are what make an impact. And here's where I think things get even more nuanced. The story of the Skywalkers, and now the Palpatines, might be a story of inherited power. But in existing Star Wars canon, they are the exception, not the rule. The vast, vast majority of Force users we've ever met are no one from nowhere. Obi-Wan Kenobi, Ahsoka Tano, Mace Windu, Kanan Jarrus, Luminera Anduli, Ezra Bridger, weird old Terra Sanube who hides his lightsaber in a cane, all nobodies from nowhere. We don't even know where Yoda and Yaddle and Baby Yoda even come from. They could just grow under cute mushrooms on a weird force planet. We don't know yet. And my personal headcanon is that even in The Phantom Menace, when Qui-Gon asks Shmi who Anakin's father was, I think Qui-Gon only asks that because he senses there is something different about Anakin. Again, the exception, not the rule. I think The Last Jedi did a great job of highlighting and celebrating the democratization of the Force by showing us the inherent power of the downtrodden stable boy on Cantonica, a.k.a. Broom Kid, a.k.a. Tamiri Blag. But also, what was being shown was nothing new. The emphasis was masterfully and beautifully done in The Last Jedi, but the actual facts aren't new to the story of Star Wars. People across the galaxy randomly being born with the Force is what it's always been. Tamiri Blegg is no different from Jarl Poof or Jocasta Nu. If Tamiri Blegg was born a couple decades earlier, he might have been identified at a young age and been growing up in the Jedi Temple, growing out his Padawan braid with Caleb Doom. So, yes, the Skywalker Saga tells the story of many Jedi who were born with power inherited from a family line, but it also tells us about many who were simply born with the exceptional gift of a connection to the Force. But even more important than that, I think Star Wars tells us the story that all of us, Force powers or not, are gifted. Let's talk about Onaiho Zea. That's the stable kid who went and built custom action figures to tell the tale of Luke Skywalker, Jedi Master, bravely standing against the First Order. Onaiho is a gifted storyteller, and without his skills, Tamiri Blagg's imagination would not have been fired in that last moment of The Last Jedi. In the very first Star Wars film, we meet dashing pilot and smuggler Han Solo. He obviously has skills. Luke, the one with the Force flowing through him, tries to convince Han to stay with the Rebels and help with the attack on the Death Star. 
When Han says no, Luke has this conversation with Leia. Leia, what's wrong? Luke, oh, it's Han. I don't know. I really thought he'd change his mind. Leia, he's got to follow his own path. No one can choose it for him. Right there, in the very first Star Wars film, we're reminded everyone has a choice. A New Hope is the story of Luke Skywalker, son of Anakin, who inherited his force power from a mighty family line. Only he can make the shot that will destroy the Death Star. But the only reason he can make that shot is because Han makes the choice to come back and help him. If Han hadn't returned, Luke would have been blown away by his own father. Great mighty bloodline you've got there, Skywalkers. You need to be saved by an orphan who was assigned the name Solo and went on to make it mean something himself. Because we all have power, we're all a part of the story if we choose to be. And all of that Death Star action that we see in A New Hope was made possible by Jin Erso, Cassian Andor, Admiral Raddus, and everyone in Rogue One who took a chance and died. Without them, Luke with the magic blood is nothing. So again, for me, The Last Jedi did a beautiful job of emphasizing democratization of power, but for me, it's been a major part of Star Wars since 1977 and constantly reinforced since then, even in the prequel era. The prequel era spends a lot of time talking about Anakin Skywalker is the chosen one, but we are introduced to all sorts of different heroes, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who was randomly born with the Force. Padme Amidala, who was born without any noticeable Force powers, but made lots of good choices. We see Rex. Rex, who was made. Made as a clone. But look at those characters. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Padme Amidala. Rex. They all make choices. They all use and hone their skills for the side of light. And I don't ever look at those characters and say, Obi-Wan is more important because he has the Force. Or Padme is more important because she was a politician. Or Rex is less because he was a clone. I think even in the prequel era that emphasizes Anakin as a chosen one, the story of everyone, no matter who you are or where you're from or what your skills are, having value, having power, is there. And I think that idea is heavily supported in The Rise of Skywalker. The theme of everyone has a role to play, drawing strength from our friends, is everywhere. From Finn's funny early line when Rey says she needs to go alone and Finn says alone with friends, Poe's entire arc is trying to hold on to the hope that if they lead, good people will follow. Ben Solo, another mighty force user, makes his greatest contribution to the fight against Palpatine by simply showing up and reminding Rey that she is not alone. There's Zori Bliss's great line to Poe, that's how they win, by making you think you're alone. To me, this is part of the power of Rey needing to use two blades to defeat the Emperor, who makes a big deal out of being the one true Emperor. Again and again, this is emphasized. And of course, the great victory of Lando and Chewie flying in with all of that support for the Resistance, setting up one of my favorite lines in the movie. The line spoken by Admiral Griss. They're not a navy, they're just people. That line alone might be the most democratic statement in all of Star Wars. Hell, even whiny space Nazi General Armitage Hux made a difference. By passing info to the Resistance, he let our heroes know how to begin their journey to finding Exegol and stopping Palpatine. His arc is a great inversion of Rose's message of not fighting what you hate, but saving what you love. He fought only out of hate. I don't care if you win, I need Kylo Ren to lose. And because he fought out of hate, not hope, he ended up dead. But he still had power. He still had a choice. General Hux still helped save the galaxy. So to sum up, I don't personally believe the democracy of Star Wars is lessened by where Rey's power comes from. If you took hope and joy from the idea that anyone, anywhere, can have inherent power... I think Star Wars still tells that story. Maybe you come from a line of Force users like Ben Solo or Rey. Maybe you're randomly born with the Force like Ahsoka Tano or Obi-Wan Kenobi or Finn. Maybe you're a great pilot like Poe Dameron or Han Solo. Maybe you're a natural leader like Padme Amidala or Mon Mothma. Maybe you're an amazing technician like Rose Tico or Babu Frick. Maybe you're born just 
overflowing with natural charm like Lando Calrissian or Baby Yoda. Or maybe you're just brave and put the good of everyone else over yourself like Janna or Bodhi Rook or BB-8 or Wicket or Jar Jar Binks or Claude or any number of Star Wars characters. Maybe you're just really good at telling a story like Oniho Zaya. For me, Star Wars repeatedly tells the tale that your station in life does not define you. Your inherent gifts don't define you. Everyone has power, from Babu Frick to Rey Skywalker. The question is, how will they use it? And if you embrace Star Wars as a morality tale as guidance, maybe take comfort from going through the mental exercise of applying that idea to yourself. We all have different skills. We all have different strengths. Some might be natural talents inherited by DNA. Maybe you're a great singer or naturally gifted at math or sports. Maybe you have skills you've trained for. You're a pilot or a chef or just really good at throwing parties and bringing people together. The list of real-life powers is endless. And I think it's worth thinking through the powers that we all have and asking how can we use them like a Jedi, like a Skywalker, to bring peace joy, to stand up and resist the things you think are hurting other people. How can we choose to use our powers in a way that fulfills ourselves and still reaches out to others the way Ray constantly reaches out? Regardless of the minutia of your personal interpretation of Star Wars lore and where exactly force power comes from and how they work, to me, the metaphor is clear. You have power. You have choice. What are you going to do with your power? So that is my take on democratization of power in Star Wars. So moving on to the last thing I want to talk about, and that is Palpatine being in the movie at all. At the end of The Last Jedi, with Snoke gone, I was initially so excited by the idea of Kylo Ren as the main villain of the final movie. I kept thinking about what pressure that would put on him and on his choices. And I'm sure There are many great ways to tell that story. I have brainstormed ideas and fan-fictioned all up inside my own head, and I get it. There are ways to tell that story for sure. But I think there's also a big pitfall of that story that was avoided by not having Kylo be the main antagonist. Because if the ultimate conclusion of the trilogy in the overall Skywalker saga puts the emphasis on dealing with Kylo as the big bad, it puts huge emphasis on his story, possibly to the detriment of Rey's story. If Rey were to follow the tradition of the Jedi, she would rather turn Kylo back to the light than have to kill him. This could possibly lead to versions of the story where Rey is diminished because the focus is on Kylo. Will Kylo make the right choice or not? It also puts Rey in the bad position of needing to save Kylo to save the galaxy. It gets into the nebulous territory of Rey fixing what can be read as an abusive man, or having to face her own darkness by possibly striking him down. Very quickly, all of Rey's ultimate decisions in the third act of the movie would be entirely framed by her relationship to Kylo and not about her beliefs, feelings, and choices about herself. Rey needing to save or kill Kylo also very quickly gets into much more direct mirroring of Luke and Vader's dynamic in Return of the Jedi. By creating the antagonist of Palpatine, it created room for Rey and Kylo's story to be different. Rey is wrestling with a problem that is entirely about herself and what the existence of Palpatine makes her fear about herself. Dealing with Kylo's turn to Ben as the climax of the second act allows it to be given weight and focus while reserving the third act, the actual climax of the film, to be centered on Rey. Kylo's turn back to Ben Solo is a part of Rey's journey. She gives in to her anger, signaled by using Kylo's red blade, and stabs him. She senses this also caused the death of Leia, thus reinforcing her fear that she will hurt the people she loves. Ray realizes her anger is taking her down a path she does not want to go. And because that's not the person she wants to be, she reaches out in kindness and heals Kylo. She then says she did want to take his hand, Ben's hand, and puts the choice exactly where it belongs, on Kylo slash Ben. So Ray is a part of Ben's transformation, 
but the actions she is taking are about her and her journey. When she stabs him, it's about her anger. When she heals him, it's about her kindness. Both stabbing and healing him is Rey acting on her own agency in wrestling with her own identity. She then says, in a simple space opera way, by saying, I did want to take your hand, Ben's hand, she is saying, I see who you really are, I relate to your pain and your loneliness and your anger, but I would never be with you unless you changed, and that's on you, Ben Solo. A simple, and to me, healthy statement of fact. Ben then does play a role in the third act. His arrival reminds Ray that she is not alone, and in his most heroic act, Ben gives his life so Ray can live. It's a selfless act, which according to existing lore and canon, is what allows him to become one with the Force. Now, I know there's a lot of different concerns and opinions around everything to do with Raylo and Ben's end, but I will save that for another episode. For now, I would just like to say I very much like the Star Wars poetry here. Anakin was defined by his selfish need to save Padme because he could not live without her. Ben chooses to give selflessly so Rey can live. It's not about him, it's about her. So, having an antagonist that is not Kylo allowed us to focus on his transformation in the second act, give it its own weight, and then make Rey the absolute focus of the third act. So in my opinion, having an antagonist that is not Kylo avoided some possible pitfalls. Also, in my opinion, having Palpatine as the villain and having Rey related to him is a way to once again center Rey as the main character of this film. Again, I know there are big uh, Kylo fans and Raylo fans who, who feel like they are the dual uh, protagonist, as Abrams has described him. This is just me analyzing the actual structure of the film. I think The Rise of Skywalker chooses to center Rey as the main character. And given that, I think it's also worth thinking about Rey's general journey in comparison to Anakin and Luke. Both Anakin and Luke were desperate to escape, to become Jedi Knights and explore the galaxy. Rey's journey, in some ways, has been more internal. She doesn't want to leave Jakku. She wants her family to return. She's not chomping at the bit to use her power in a war. She wants to understand her power. She wants to understand herself. For Rey, defeating Palpatine isn't just taking down a random evil guy. It's her having to proactively wrestle with her own fears and her own hopes. It marries the external conflict to Rey's internal conflict, which has been a big part of her journey. And of course, with Snoke dead, Palpatine's return ties the entire saga together. We don't need to spend any time explaining who he is. Maybe people would have liked to hear how he survived, and I understand that. But at least we know who and what he is immediately. We know what he stands for. Palpatine is a giant public service announcement. This is what your face looks like on the dark side. This is what it looks like when you give in to hate and anger. He's manipulative, cruel, and cares only about revenge and power. He is a picture of what Ray does not want to be, and more importantly, he's a portrait of what Ray just isn't. His presence recenters the conflict between the Sith and the Jedi, and we get to see what they truly represent. The Sith are anger and decay and lies and possession. The Jedi are kindness, defense, support, and the selfless love of yourself and others. But again, this centers Rey. She wants the mantle of Jedi. She wants an understanding of what her power is and what to do with it. She learns that the power may have come from the actual blood lineage of Palpatine, but that doesn't really matter because it's her power and she gets to decide how to wield it. By calling out to the Jedi, she chooses that path. She chooses to be the Jedi who ends the threat of the Sith. And again, I'm sure there are ways to tell the story without Palpatine. I'm sure there are ways to tell the story with Palpatine, but without Rey being his granddaughter. But I also think when you look at the movie structurally, those choices I don't feel were made out of fan service or to correct The Last Jedi. I think they were made to tie the entire saga together and to put maximum focus on Rey and her agency to choose her identity. Again, I totally understand that those choices might not work for you, but I also think it's important to imagine why the creators made the choices they did in a way that affords them the benefit of the doubt. In classic Star Wars tradition, 
I want to attempt to see it from their point of view. So, to sum up, I think Ray chooses who she wants to be by reflecting on the positive statements of the mentors and friends in her life. She chooses to reject her own understandable anger and violence and be who she always has been, someone kind and strong and resilient. Being a Palpatine focuses her fear of her own violence. The villains try to break her and get her to believe she's defined by her blood, but Rey faces her fears and denies that. If you're bothered by Rey being a part of a bloodline and the story ultimately being about the Skywalkers and now the Palpatines, again, that's understandable. But I don't think it's a blow to the democracy of Star Wars. Because again and again in Star Wars, and particularly in The Rise of Skywalker, we see individuals shape their own fates, not through preordained destiny, but by their choices. Anakin chose to hack Mace Windu's arm off and give in to Palpatine's manipulations. He also chose to save Luke and throw Sheev down a shaft. Luke chose not to kill his own father, but throw his weapon aside. Luke chose to return from his isolation on Octo and force project a crate to save the Resistance. Kylo Ren chose to kill his father, and Ben Solo chose to give his life so Rey could live. Leia makes lots of choices, and they're always about duty, sacrifice, and trying to save people. At some point, Sheev Palpatine chose the dark side and never made the choice to turn back. Rey makes so many choices. She chooses to heal Ben. She chooses to face Palpatine. Rey chooses not to give up hope, but instead rise in the Force and take her final steps on her journey to becoming a Jedi. These are all choices made by people from families strong in the Force, but they're not the only people in the galaxy who made choices. I could list all the choices of Kenobi, Ahsoka Tano, Ezra Bridger, and all the other Force users who don't come from a family line. We could imagine what choices Broom Kid Tamiri Blegg will make someday. And then there are all the heroes who are not Force-sensitive to our current canon knowledge. Padme Amidala, Han Solo, Chewbacca, Rex, Baze Malbus, Poe Dameron, Harrison Dula, R2-D2, the guy in the Tanta V4 and Rogue One who gives up on opening the door and sticks the Death Star plans through the cracks so Vader doesn't get them, and on and on and on. All people who made a significant difference because, to me, the moral of Star Wars is we all have a choice which gives us all power. And if you're still not sure about some of these choices, try playing out other story ideas in your head. And maybe you would come up with something you'd like better, and that's great. What if is a fun part of Star Wars fandom. But I'd also suggest just trying to embrace the story as it's been told and think about how the movie was structured to give maximum attention and focus to Rey while also finishing up telling the story of the sequel trilogy and the entire Skywalker saga. And finally, I want to close with the power of Rey choosing Skywalker. A major theme of the sequel story is, how do you find your own future when you're trapped in the shadow of the past? Rey literally lives in the wreckage of a previous generation. She discovers the legend of Luke Skywalker is real, and she needs to reach out to him. And he doesn't want to be a legend. Not only are the Jedi real, but she is their last hope. Emperor Palpatine isn't just a terrifying shadow of the past. He's her awful, lousy, lying grandfather. Ben Solo broke under the pressure of living up to the past. He lashed out wanting to kill it rather than face it. Rey deals with that same pressure and finds a way to both honor the past and make her own future. To me, her picking the name Skywalker isn't a denial of her identity. She picks it because she relates to the Skywalkers. They're not her family by blood, but they are in their shared spirit, a spirit Rey chooses to emphasize and carry forward. And most importantly, she's not blindly following the Skywalker legacy. She respectfully buries the lightsabers that symbolize the old generation. But she is taking a new blade, inspired by her own journey into the future. And if you're still not sure about Rey as a Skywalker, think about what that message means for people who have been adopted or are raising adopted kids or who have changed their name to better fit their own identity in any way for any reason. Hell, I grew up being called Joe, and at a certain point in my life, I decided Joseph was right for me. For many people, choosing their own name gives them a sense of peace and purpose 
and power. Rey choosing the name Skywalker is a huge validation of a major Star Wars theme. You get power from all sorts of places, money, government, friends, randomly bestowed upon you at birth or from your family lineage. But the thing that defines you is what you do with that power. It's not Palpatine's power, it's Rey's. In a saga that has followed a bloodline, the Skywalkers, from Anakin to Luke and Leia to Ben Solo, the final beat of the saga says it's not the blood that matters, it's the spirit. It's the choice. Regardless of where that power came from, or what kind of power it is, we can choose to use that power for good, for kindness and knowledge and defense. And if our hero, Rey, can make that choice, so can we. We can all choose to be Jedi. We can all choose to be Skywalkers. And thinking about that makes me both weepy and want to dance around my living room swinging a toy lightsaber. And I invite anyone who wants to join me to dance around hum the Star Wars theme, and just try not to break a lamp. Unless you choose to, because it's your power and it's your choice. Break that lamp. Anyway, those are just a few thoughts about the rise of Skywalker and the meaning of Rey's lineage for Star Wars in general. And I really want to thank uh, Sarah for the articulate grievance and for everybody else uh, who has sent in concerns. And I hope that helps. And even if it, it doesn't, even if you still have a different perspective, I hope it at least uh, gave you some fun or some joy to think through the different thoughts. If you have a grievance or deep dive question, please send them to us on Twitter. Please do use the hashtag Star Wars Counseling. That's counseling spelled with an S. That makes it much easier for me to find them. And speaking of finding things, you can find me on all the social media is at Joseph Scrimshaw. You can check out my other podcast, Obsessed, and all of my live shows and comedy albums and comedy book. That's all on josephscrimshaw.com. You can also like Force Center on Facebook and follow us on Twitter is at Force Center Pod and buy our merch at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. You can support our Patreon by visiting patreon.com slash Force Center. More fun stuff coming on Patreon very soon. And until next time, as Han Solo once said in a moment of brutal honesty, I don't know how we're going to get out of this one. That's it for Star Wars Counseling. <laughs>